Shirley uh, brought in an article. Uh, for those of you who received the Meredith News, there's a great article by John Harrigan uh, on river drives. So that will complement everything I said. Uh, I will say tonight. So thanks for bringing that in. That's great. So we are going to be taking a step back in time to late 1800s, early 1900s, prior to the establishment of the White Mountain National Forest. So I really focus on the White Hills and the White Mountains where logging was, <coughs> was taking place at an incredible rate during that period of time. Uh, so I will be showing you some tools, and it becomes an interactive program. I will be passing tools out. You'll get a chance to uh, look at them up close and personal. And then I have some slides that are reproductions of uh, black and white photographs. I knew the former archaeologist at the White Mountain National Forest. His name was Kyle Ronke. And he was gracious enough and also welcomed folks to come down to the supervisor's office. I guess now you've got to go up to the supervisor's office because I believe it's in Ashland or north of Ashland. Uh, but he liked to have folks come in and just look at the historical files. And uh, so I pulled out old logging photographs and took pictures of the pictures. So I'm still in the dinosaur age. I have a slide projector. I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, yes, sir? What is the period of time this incredible forest? Uh, this was 18, now let's call it 1880, 1890 to around 1911, 1913. Okay, so before we actually get into the tools, we really need to come up with a definition of a tool. Who can give me a definition of what a tool is? An implement that does something for you. Okay, how does it, uh, how does it work? Does it improve the situation or helps you? Okay, makes you either work more efficiently or faster. And typically, where would you hold the tool when you are using it? In your hand. So I like to make the point extension of your hand. So a tool is an extension of your hand that makes your work much more efficient or easier, faster. All right? And logging tools fit into six basic categories. And we'll go through them one at a time. And I'll ask for an example. It doesn't have to be a logging tool. You can come up with any kind of tool that might fit this category. But who can give me an example of a cutting tool? Saw? Knife. Knife scissors, any of those. How about a turning tool? That's a machine. Hand bit. An auger? Well, no, you hang on to that idea. I've got another category for that one. How about something real simple? Screwdriver, absolutely. How about a holding tool? Vice, clamp, pliers, absolutely. How about a striking tool? This is easy. Hammer. Oops. Now, my first experience uh, teaching was in an eighth grade class. A friend of mine had an eighth grade class, uh, I think it was in Holdenness, come to think of it. And uh, he heard I had this cool tool collection, so he said, would you come into the classroom and talk to my eighth graders? And I, sure, that sounds like a great idea. I'd never had any experience with eighth graders. So I'm at this point in the program when I'm asking them for an example of something boring. <laughs> you, yeah, you know what the answer was. But how about a boring tool? Ah, uh, the auger, absolutely. All right, a measuring tool? Tape, tape. tape right. And ruler, any of those, right? I tell students, uh, you know, this part of my finger is an inch long, and I can measure this room. It takes about 15 minutes, but with a tape me measure, you're much more efficient. And for you seamstresses, you know that uh, this is basically a yard. So there will be a test later on. Um, no one can go home until they've got all the answers right. So let's look at the most important tool. It was the single pole axe, and the term pole means head, head of the axe. So when you look at sketches of axes that came over from Europe, they essentially were just steel wrapped around the wooden handle. They didn't have this added weight. So by adding weight, the tool became a lot more efficient because you had a lot more force behind your swing. The other thing that the Americans did with time is they made curvature in the handle, and that made it a lot more comfortable to swing less likely to slide out of your hands. Prior to that, it was just a straight handle. And then the other thing Americans did is they took that round handle, that was typical, and they flattened the two sides. Now you had flattened surface in your hands. So those are adaptations that the Americans made to the axe when it came from Europe. 
um, made it that much more efficient. So typically, when they were sharpening an axe, it would be at night, it'd take two fellows, fellow on the water wheel, he'd be cranking, and the other fellow would sharpen his axe, and then they'd switch places and take turns and do the, the fellow would do his axe. And they could get these razor sharp, such that you could literally shave with your axe in the morning. They were that sharp. So here's your uh, first quiz. Uh, what's the difference between this axe and this axe? Double bitted, right? We've got some folks in the audience who know the lingo, right? Double bitted axe. Now, why would you want two bits? Why would you want? That's right. If one gets dull, you can just use the other edge until. That evening, yeah. Well, there's another reason too. Swing left and right you can, yeah. You can swing, and you can also cut two trees at the same time. <laughs> the problem is, is when you're doing that, what you're putting in is in the cow's mouth, which is the notch, and it decides which direction the tree is going to fall, and they fall on your head every time. So, yeah, I, I bet they only tried that once. There's a real technical reason for having two bits and for sharpening them a different way. Does any that's right. So you would have an axe that has fat cheeks as it approaches the cutting edge. And that's for knotting the log. So they were cutting spruce that, no exaggeration, was two feet in diameter and hundreds of feet tall. Well, maybe not a hundred, but we like to think they were. Anyways, they were really tall. And the bottom branches hadn't seen sunlight for years. And so they were dead, typically dead. And when spruce branches die, they turn hard as a rock. So if you had thin cheeks, as you would for felling, and you tried to knot the log, you would probably bend the steel over when you hit that dead branch. And if it was 20 below zero, probably take a chunk of steel right out of your axe. So they would have fat cheeks for knotting the log or limbing the branches off, and thin cheeks for felling. It really lets you get in there and get a nice wood chip out of there. Right? So there was oftentimes, if you had a double-bitted ed, a double-bitted axe, they were sharpened differently. The other thing is, if you have an axe with fat cheeks, then it works like a splitting mall. Otherwise, if it has thin cheeks, you can spend the day trying to get the axe out of the end grain of the firewood. That's the trick. All right. So, I'm sure someone here knows what this axe is called. Broad axe, absolutely. So here's a really large broad axe, and this is a smaller diameter. They can weigh up to 13 pounds. And the reason for the broad axe is Let's say we were working for a timber baron, and we'd be hired sometime in August or September. We'd head up to the White Hills in the drainage we'd be working all winter long, and he'd give us these two axes. And everything that we needed in terms of housing, the chuck house, the uh, bunk house, the uh, horse hovel, everything was built by hand with these two tools. So let's use our imagination here. We're going to fell this tree. All right, so you use an axe with thin cheek, fell the tree down that direction, and then using my mittens here, you would score the log, which is this item right here. If I were to turn it like that, you would score the log, which means you put these little V grooves on that entire face of the log. And then a gentleman using the broad axe would come along and take all those scores off until that surface was nice and smooth. You turn the log a quarter turn, put scores in it. Somebody using the broad axe would come along and remove the scores. You would do that a total of four times. So what was originally a round log, after having used the broad axe, had become a square hand-hewn timber. Right? And they did this with this tool. And someone might say, well, what's wrong with your axe handle? Well, the reason why the handle's been steamed in this direction is it allows a fella to stand beside his work and not worry about cutting his kneecap off. Because if the handle was straight, you'd have a tendency to lean into your work. So by steaming the handle, and I'm right-handed, so this works really well for me. Flat on the bottom, sharpened at an angle on its side so you can really get a nice smooth surface. And they would use a broad axe just like someone uses a block plane, a carpenter, to get a smooth surface. So tabletops, benches, seats, anything was made with the broad axe. Right, yep. Sometimes you'll see just a little hint of the scores left behind. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So a good broad axe man 
he could keep two scores sweating, two fellows putting in scores just as fast as they could, and the fellow using the larger axe come along and take those scores off. So he was a quite the artist with this axe. In fact, there are stories where a fellow could stretch a string 60 feet long, he'd get within an eighth of an inch of that string and never cut it, swinging the broad axe. So they were real efficient. So frequently, the question is asked, well, what's the difference between a broad axe and an ads? And a number of years ago, I was doing a program, and a gentleman said, you need to have this ads. I'll give it to you. So an ads typically is used in this fashion. If the log is big enough, you can stand right on the log and smooth out the surface. And so the gentleman said, well, you should know that the fellow who owned this ads was a pretty famous fellow. Came from the state of New York, worked in the woods all his life. And his name was No Toes Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere in the uh, 1800s, or early 1900s, I'm sorry, they switched over from the axe to the two-man crosscut saw. So this is a felling saw. And what's interesting is they were able to increase their production significantly. So what took a whole day to produce with the axe, when they switched over to the two-man crosscut saws, they could produce in half a day. And what I find fascinating is that increment of increase in production was not as significant when they went from the two-man crosscut saw to the chainsaw. But we're probably talking about those big honking chainsaws that took two guys to carry, and they had to have three of them because only one of them would work. And one of them was on the way to the shop, and the other one was on the way back from the shop. But, uh, yeah, it is interesting that these fellows could cut trees down almost as efficiently with these two-man crosscut saws as they could was when they started. So before we start talking too much about saws, 